Hi there, welcome to another edition of IndyCar. Today it is the 16th of October. My name is Gordon Ross. On today's show, uh, I'm going to discuss the current situation with Brexit and also the state of play with regards to the next Scottish independence referendum, both of which are basically on the starting blocks at the moment. So we've got two major um, international you know, big deals coming up, both of which uh, will affect the future of Scotland uh, for the foreseeable future, one way or another. The Brexit, well, you're probably sick and tired of hearing about it, but today was the day. Today was the big day when something in writing has to be put forward by the British government to the European Union, which can be taken forward and turned into an agreement. Now, the reason it's today is because tomorrow sees the beginning of the European Union summit of 27 member states get together to discuss what's been proposed by the UK and whether the European Union can accept it uh, and turn the whole thing into uh, an exit agreement. Not a deal, as the way people seem to sort of characterise this as the exit deal or the Brexit deal. It's not. This is just an agreement on how the UK is going to leave the European Union, not what its trade deal will be afterwards. That has to come in about 21 months' time, two years' time. It has to come within that period, sorry. So at the moment, uh, as you know, um, Brexit negotiators from the UK have been locked in talks all through most of last night and this morning. And according to um, sources in the Republic of Ireland, yesterday the UK was required to bring forward new proposals which would break the deadlock because that was the, the deadline. They had to break the deadlock last night. What we don't know at the moment is whether that has been achieved. There's a lot of um, rather, what would you say, optimistic uh, noises coming out of the media at the moment saying they're close to a deal, they're on the brink of a deal, it's within reach, they can see the pathway ahead, you know, all of these phrases, but nobody actually knows. Uh, whether Boris and his team have managed to put this together. But interestingly, the European Union has refused uh, to meet with Boris Johnson and they won't discuss Brexit with Boris. They will only discuss it through the negotiators, which is interesting. But uh, a bit of an aside. So the situation is still quite fluid. And uh, today the European Union will decide whether there is enough here uh, to warrant going on with the talks. And if that were the case, they might grant a little bit more time and perhaps they will convene yet another um, European Union summit sometime near the end of the month to finally decide one way or the other whether um, Britain has done enough to produce some kind of workable solution to the Irish frontier. Because it is a, it's a frontier between Europe and the UK. The Democratic Unionist Party has been making a lot of noises about how it can't accept having uh, a two-border system. In other words, border checks somewhere in, uh, in Northern Ireland and also customs checks happening between Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK. But the fact of the matter is that the DUP will probably just be forced to accept whatever uh, is decided because although they're making a lot of noise, the DUP do not represent the entirety of the people of Northern Ireland, very, very far from it, in fact. Um, they are less and less important in Northern Ireland and the, the opposition to the DUP uh, has a larger share of the vote than they do, as far as I uh, understand it. But what, what's interesting is the DUP is now making noises about uh, also demanding even more money from the um, from the British government in exchange for accepting whatever this uh, deal is. But the point is that you cannot really separate um, from the EU without Northern Ireland having some kind of special status because the <laughs> Northern Ireland is basically a bit of Ireland that the British state is occupying. And it's always been like, like that. It's, it's an occupied territory. That's what it is. It's six counties of somebody else's country in which Britain had planted a colony uh, of what you would call loyalists or unionists, whatever you want to call them, and, and they are stuck there. They're basically surrounded on all sides. So the problem is how to deal with all of this. That's always been a sticky issue, and Northern Irish and Irish politics generally are extremely convoluted because of the history between the UK and uh, the Irish Republic. But I think that um, the DUP will be forced to accept whatever Boris Johnson says and they'll extract an enormous price 
from the UK for having to accept it. I'm sure they, they will uh, be demanding a bill of billions of pounds in, in aid to Northern Ireland for, for the next century to come if this were the case. But nobody knows for sure. I mean, it might still come down to the no-deal Brexit. The Europeans don't want that. But at the same time, if the UK is not prepared to make a sacrifice and decide that Northern Ireland is a special case because it has to be a special case. Britain has made Northern Ireland a special case. It's made Britain, uh, Northern Ireland a special case by continuing to occupy it and it's made it a special case by voting to leave the European Union. All of this comes down to the front door of the British state. They've decided to leave the, U the, the European Union. They've decided to continue op occupying the six counties of Northern Ireland with a, a British... Um, the descendants of the British colonists, if you like. So they've manufactured this whole situation themselves. So both the Unionists who live in Northern Ireland and the British state are going to have to suck it up because the European Union did not create this difficulty. In fact, they, they had no wish for this ever to happen in the first place. The question is whether the British state will be able to do enough and pay enough uh, in terms of bribery to the DUP in order to make this work. And I, I question the, the way the DUP will use this money and what they will do with it. They don't have a good record in Northern Ireland for dealing um, straight with, with money. There, there are question marks over corruption all the time over there with the DUP. Anyway, uh, I don't want to get dragged into Northern Irish politics. But to bring things back to Scotland for a minute, uh, I was pointing out yesterday that a Section 30 order, um, if it's being demanded by Scotland to, in order to get our independence, then by the same token, the Sewell Convention, uh, Britain is required to, to seek a Section 30 order from Scotland if they want to Brexit because Scotland and England are equal partners in a union, supposedly. That means what, what works for one has to work for the other. We have not had anybody seeking permission from Scotland for Britain to leave the European Union. And because of that, we can stand up and say, look, we haven't had a Section 30 order from you about your Brexit. If you ask our permission over Brexit, uh, and you give us a Section 30 order, then that's great. That's what we demand from, from you. You're busy uh, denying us a Section 30 order. It, it, it's quid pro quo. I mean, the, the two countries are supposed to be equal. They have equal law and equal status in the law. And so if, if, it's, uh, if we have to demand permission from England to have a referendum on our own self-determination, uh, then the same condition must be put on Brexit. If they want to leave the European Union, they have to get Scotland's permission to do that. If they're not prepared to do that, then we don't agree to it. There are a lot of, there's a lot of headbutting going to happen over this, but the facts of the matter are simple. The SNP has now said that there will be an independence referendum next year. They haven't said when, but it, it's widely expected to be sometime in the spring of next year at the latest, I would suggest. When they name the date for that is, is really a question of timing now. Britain is at the, the threshold of leaving Europe now. It's standing on the cliff edge right at this moment, waiting to see if, and we're all waiting to see if British negotiators have made enough movement forward towards the EU for the, the European Union to accept a compromise. From the mood music, as I say, that's coming out of the BBC, it's all terribly optimistic, and the British press is all going on about how Boris Johnson's almost at the deal. Boris Johnson's not even at the negotiations, remember, so he's not making the deal. But what we don't know yet is whether the European Union can accept any of this. Um, they have said that the British government is full of good intentions, it's full of wonderful ideas, nothing in writing yet. Uh, and if they're only writing the agreement right now or overnight last night as the first draft, and that's that's the, the actual news that's come out, is they have started to draft an agreement. And this is both the EU and the British negotiators are starting to thrash out something in writing uh, that can be put to the British Parliament and the EU at its meeting uh, tomorrow. So there's no time left. I mean, whatever this agreement is, if it's written on the back of a fag packet, back of an envelope, if it runs to one sheet of A4 with bullet points, whatever it is, it has to be finished today. 
When it comes to um, Scotland and its independence referendum, if you ever take the bother or the trouble to read the so-called Edinburgh Agreement, this is what creates this Section 30 order. A Section 30 order is uh, a democratic instrument which allows the Scotland Act, I think it's 1998, but the, uh, yeah, 1998, the Scotland Act, uh, to suspend uh, all claims to constitutional uh, power from the British state and the Scottish state, incidentally, to the people of Scotland. In other words, both parliaments uh, relinquish their grip on control over the future of Scotland and hand it to the electorate. That's what Section 30 does. And it also promises, Section 30 promises, that both governments work together to agree the format uh, of, of the referendum it has to be legislated for by the Scottish Parliament, not the British Parliament, and that legislation is going through at the moment. And it must be fair, and it must be agreed what the question is, and there must be a clear outcome for all to see, and that all parties must respect the end result. And by the way, there is absolutely no mention of it being once in a generation or once in a lifetime. Nothing of the kind in that agreement was ever said by anybody or written down in any law anywhere. There's never been a commitment given by either side that it should be once in a generation or once in a lifetime. That was made up by the press and by the politicians after the event. So what happens is basically a carbon copy of what Alex Salmon went through uh, back in 2012, 2013, where the, Ed the Edinburgh Agreement was signed by him and David Cameron on behalf of their governments, on behalf of their parliaments. The agreement was reached. The referendum was run largely by the UK, remember, uh, the Electoral Commission, and votes were taken to England for counting in some cases, something which caused an awful lot of anger up here, and I don't think that will be happening next time. I think Scotland will take full control over how the referendum is run this time, but it will still be fair. Everybody will be able to see where their votes are. Everybody will be able to see where the ballot boxes are. Nothing untoward will happen. But this time, uh, basically, Scotland needs to be given the choice. Do we stay with England and go out with Brexit? Or do we stay with the European Union and not to leave with Brexit. In other words, it's a simple binary choice. It's a very easy question to frame. Do you want to remain in the EU or do you want to, to leave with England? But the easiest way to put it is, do you want uh, Scotland to be an independent country? The question still remains the same. It's just the circumstances have changed. Incidentally, talking of circumstances, um, one of the EU commissioners said yesterday that if um, a substantial political event were to happen in the UK, so something consequential, something that maybe brought about a change of government or a change of policy or some other major um, political change in the UK in the meantime, then the European Union would be minded to give uh, the UK an extension, a short extension, in order to take the negotiations from wherever they are now through to a new conclusion. So there is always a little bit of wriggle room from the EU. They're always willing to offer the UK another lifeline if it will take it. The big question at the moment for me is, have, has the British government been able to offer enough billions to the DUP to get them to shut up about uh, the whole business of the integrity of the UK? Uh, and if that's the case, uh, has enough been done to convince the European Union that this two-border system will work? Checks at one border and then checks at another. Who knows? I mean, it's as usual with everything British. It's a fantastically complicated, unnecessarily bad compromise. And that is the hallmark of everywhere that the British state has ever colonised. It leaves a colossal mess behind that the rest of us have to clear up. At the moment... It's all hanging by a thread. We don't know what will happen if it's a no-deal Brexit. All bets are off. There were reports yesterday in the press that um, the United Kingdom Civil Service was asked if there were plans uh, for the setting up of internment camps. 
around the UK. These would be to deal with the large numbers uh, of prisoners, <laughs> I'm assuming prisoners, people arrested uh, in rioting or civil unrest caused by a no-deal Brexit. And actual, actually the civil service, uh, the British government, refused to say yes or no that they had considered sites for internment camps because remember they don't have enough prison places uh, for the thousands of people who would have to be arrested if there was mass civil unrest. These are worrying times and frankly I think with all the pressure mounting on Boris Johnson um, to come up with a deal that, that can be agreed at, in Westminster, that can be agreed in, in Brussels, uh, he's out of time. Today is the day and unless something happens by midnight tonight um, then it's it's over. No deal Brexit is the default position. The European Union keeps offering you know, uh, lifelines, olive branches to the UK and they keep swatting them away um, because the UK has created this conundrum for itself. It can't get itself out of Europe without getting itself out of Ireland as well. And that's its own fault. Um, if you colonise places and refuse to give them up, even though they're costing you billions a year to maintain, then you've only got yourself to blame, really. Uh, people are asking why the SNP is continuing to go on and on about uh, going only for a referendum with a Section 30 order. The simple reason for that is they don't want this violent confrontation. They don't want there to be uh, rioting and civil unrest because the whole idea uh, of the Scottish way of getting independence is that it's entirely peaceful and that it's done entirely democratically without a drop of blood being spilt, despite the provocations of some uh, unionist thugs who have been displaying their um, aggression on the streets of Glasgow a few weeks ago. That kind of threat isn't going to work on a Scottish system which is based on peaceful negotiation, peaceful democratic processes. Section 30 order, it has to come, because I pointed out to somebody else today that we, we were arguing over whether the European Union would interfere in the independence battle between the Scottish Government and the British Government. And I would say to him that I thought that the European Union could put a precondition on agreeing a deal with the UK. And that precondition might be that they have to give Scotland a Section 30 order. Because although that, that's technically a little bit of interference, what the EU would be doing is saying to the UK, if you want to deal with us, you need to deal with the Scots people and give them the opportunity to have a say on this because you haven't done that. You haven't given them a democratic uh, vote on Brexit. You've ignored the fact that they voted no to Brexit. And they could put a precondition on it saying you must give them a Section 30 order. That's not interfering in the voting process. That is just saying that the UK needs to take the brakes off and stop preventing Scots from making the choice. Whether the European Union will do that, I don't know. Probably not. They, they've taken a pretty, uh, what's the word, a pretty callous view of the things that have been happening in Spain recently. And the European Union has tied itself in knots over this business of Article 7 of the European Union itself. It's its own constitution which says that member states must not use military forces against their own civilian populations. And it's the definition of military forces in Spain that is tripping them up. If somebody says, well, a whole lot of black clad guys with weapons and armor and shields pouring out of armored cars, are they police or are they military? I would say these are paramilitary forces and that definition could make Spain's um, actions against Catalonia illegal and against European Union regulations. So anyway, these are all other forces that the European Union needs to grapple with. They need to decide on just how much good behaviour um, they are prepared to insist upon from their members and how much bad behaviour they will tolerate before they punish people. At the moment, Spain is an aggressive, dictatorial and violent state that is repressing the Catalan independence movement instead of actually engaging with democratic processes. If they wanted to fight Catalan uh, moves for independence, they should do so at the ballot box like everybody else does. That's how things are supposed to be won.
Anyway, I've rambled on a bit long, so I, I will see you all again uh, tomorrow. I'll be, uh, as far as I know, hosting Scotland at 7 this evening and on Thursday night as well. So I'll be seeing you later on in the week. It'll be interesting to see what happens later today if Boris manages to get away uh, with pulling some kind of deal um, out of the hat like a magician this afternoon. My prediction is there will be some kind of fudge. They will have agreed some form of words that means they can take the, the negotiations further and it will be something very simple that Boris can take to Parliament that says something very simple that they can all get behind so that the process can keep rumbling on for a few more months. But inevitably it ends up with Brexit of some kind. The European Union doesn't want a chaotic Brexit if it can be avoided. Neither, I think, does the UK because it's going to be incredibly damaging to the country if it does. So I think some kind of, my prediction is some kind of um, nil-nil draw in this. It, it's going to be a fudge, it's going to be a compromise, a statement between both sides which say that we've made significant progress, we believe it's enough to warrant a further short extension and we commend this statement to the House of Commons. If they if they vote on that and say that's acceptable to the UK Parliament, then they go forward to more substantive negotiations. That's my prediction for what will happen. It does not have any bearing on the continuing fight to get independence for Scotland because even if Brexit wasn't happening, independence is still necessary because Scotland is still being controlled by another country and nobody should ever accept that. Uh, I made a post this morning, which is a reposting of something from 2015 that I wrote, which is basically this, that um, Scotland has all of the necessary powers to be an independent country except for two. And the two key powers are we do not have control over our funding, that's our taxation, and we don't have a military. The two things you need to be independent from England are cash and enough weapons to tell them to get lost. We have neither at the moment. And this is how we are being controlled by the, uh, the British state. We are defenceless, they keep us vulnerable and they take all our money off us so that we do not have the cash uh, to invest in things like armed forces for ourselves, to invest in a method of protecting Scotland from the bullying nature of its larger neighbour. And these are the key elements for us at the moment, that we need to get back the powers to protect ourselves and powers to use our own taxes for what we want, instead of giving half of our taxation to England and never seeing any of it again, uh, and being left with pocket money to run the country on. It's ridiculous. No other country in the world would allow this to continue. Right, I'm off. I will see you later. Have a great day. See you at Scotland at 7 tonight. Bye for now.